it, so that way they can keep their independence. And I mean, it's like, like I, I was there for about not in Hong Kong per se, but in China for about a month. Good evening, everybody. Oh. It is 6.01, so it's time to start our curriculum advisory committee meeting and I'm Betsy Vaughn and I am a school board member who was liaison with this committee last last school year and um, you know, we'll see we have a board reorganization so I may only be here a couple months although being a former school teacher 38 years I really really um, like being in the curriculum advisory committee. Anyway, um, until we get in the next step, you have your agendas, I hope, and everybody picked up all the handouts that are there by the door. If you didn't, just feel free to get up and grab some. And I see some returning faces. Notice I didn't say old faces. <laughs> I'm very sensitive to that myself. And uh, some brand new faces. And we welcome all of you, and we will be selecting a new chair and a um, co-chair, however, a vice chair. However, let's just go around the room, and we'll start with these. We'll, we'll start right over here, and we'll just go around the room and say your name. And um, you know, we don't need to know where you went to elementary school, <laughs> unless you want to tell us. This is significant. But um, what your what your role is, and um, we'll just go from there. Awesome. Good evening. I am Candace Alavedo. I am a director in curriculum and instruction. I work primarily with the high school. <clears throat> Ryan Libby, uh, coordinator in research accountability and assessment. I am Bethany Quisimary, and I am the director for elementary curriculum and instruction. We'll go around this way. How's that? Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Saunders. I'm with the school board attorney's office. And I'm Judy Wilkerson. I teach at Florida Gulf Coast University, and I went to AP Mars Elementary School. <laughs> <laughs> and where's that? And, and I remember when we used to be able to leave the school and go to my friend Teresa's father's pharmacy to get chocolate. <laughs> in the middle of the school day? I was able to do that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Long ago. Long ago. <laughs> I just thought that story would <laughs> Yes. I am April Ketron. I am a magnet lead teacher at Prince Marsh Middle School. I went to elementary school at Tropic Isles. <laughs> oh, I, I started something with the rest of the county. Yes. Your product yes. of Lee. How many of you are products of um, Lee County schools? Wow. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is um, Eric Well, I was the intervention specialist at Island Coast, and I've been at Mariner for four years now. Previous to that, I was there for 10 years. I teach American Sign Language, Spanish, and ESC, and I went to school in New York, and we could not go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there. I'm over the door. <laughs> That table over there. Oh, I guess I'll go. Uh, my name is Jonathan Highland. I'm actually a compliance analyst at a company called RNL. Um, I'm just, I really want to be involved with the, the school board and be really involved with the education system. It's been kind of a passion of mine since I've been really little. I'm hoping to get my master's and doctorates hopefully on further education. So just learning, learning experience and hopefully I can give some advice to help, help the kids. So great. Uh, I'm Stephanie Snyder, and it's nice to be around teachers again. I spent 34 years in teaching and <laughs> development, etc., and then worked for a technology company. And I'm from New York. <laughs> <laughs> so my I'm from New Jersey. Oh, I just love that. I love that. So, um, and my doctorate's in computer integration and the use of, of uh, emerging technologies. But I have to relearn from you people. <laughs> I'm Christina Stewart. Um, I do have my teaching certification in elementary education. I'm not a teacher right now. I do work in law enforcement, but I still want to be involved in education, and I went to Pine Island Elementary. <laughs> oh my God! Pointing <laughs> <laughs> this table over here. My name is Ruth Ann Marlowe. I'm a retired uh, uh, teacher and uh, principal from Dade County Schools and an adjunct professor from Nova University and Barry University. 
Stephanie Webb, so we have Stephanie squared. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, actually worked in Lee County for 40 years. Um, everything from pre-K head start to staff development, and then went on to work at the Department of Education and Florida Gulf Coast University. So I'm now retired and working in private schools as a staff development specialist. Hi, I'm uh, Marissa Beyer, and I have been teaching for now seven years. And I am not a product of Lee County, but I am a product of the second best school district, Broward. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my parents are teachers there. My mom is at Cypress Bay. My dad is at Stony Douglas. And um, yes, he was there. Um, oh, no, so no, no, yes, no. I have that interesting perspective as well. Um, they've been teachers in combined 66 years in that county. Wow. And, um, I am now a teacher at Veterans Park. I teach eighth grade. Um, previous to that, I started in Broward, and I was at West Pine Middle, which is where I went to middle school. And then I was at Coral Springs High. Then I came over here for the big teacher recruitment fair in 2015. <laughs> Dr. Esser hired me on the spot as one of the varsity lakes for the past four years. Then I went to East Lee last year, and now I'm at Veterans Park. I've got two kids of my own. Uh, I have a little one, oh, two, two little ones. Um, they're both daughters, and I have, one is three, and the other one will be a year next month. And wow, that's <laughs> yeah. now that right over here. My name is Donna Doker, and I'm a retired technology teacher. Oh, there we go. There you go. And I went to St. Mary's Catholic School on Long Island, New York, and we would leave school for lunch and take our collection money from mass and go to Dunkin' Donuts and buy donuts. <laughs> My big confession. <laughs> 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 Couldn't hold a job. I was a speech coordinator, principal, ESE director, executive director, of staff development. Last year, I served as superintendent position. So I've been here quite a long time. I'm glad to be back with the committee. I was, my wife taught here. She's a speech pathologist, and uh, we think the world of the school district. So we haven't been able to go to my some medical issues. We haven't been able to be as involved as we would like to have been, but we're kind of getting through that now. So it's good to be here. Okay, this table. I am Ryan. I'm Sophia Wirtz. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm a retired Baltimore City Police Officer. Um, it's been almost 19 years. Um, between that time, I've tutored uh, kids in high school. I've taught high school kids. Um, right now, I'm a crisis counselor, and, for kids, and I'm always helping kids. So I wanted to, the passion of the Lord just to help with kids. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I'm um, Matthew Hoffman. I'm a, a full-time faculty at Florida Southwestern. I teach business and um, legal studies program. I'm also um, an attorney practicing on the side. Apparently, I'm also writing a textbook for students in Canada. Mm, <laughs> um, and I've got four kids in the school district here. And actually, we have one more very important person Yay, um, right here. Can you introduce yourself, please, Helen? I'm Helen Hernandez. Uh, secretary for the department. I have worked with the magnificent awesome director. Um, <coughs> actually, I went to La Paloma Elementary School <laughs> and we used to walk home for lunch every day. And where is that? That's in San Benito, the Oxford of San Benito, Texas. I mean, Texas for many years. Walking home. Yeah, okay. okay. I think I missed. Going. Anyone, and we have a good variety here, which is which is great. Now, I know some of you know each other because you've served together before, and you may know each other, a few of you from outside of that. Um, next on our agenda is the, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's the attorney. I was ready to get a chairperson, Chris. <laughs> but we have our attorney because there's some very important um, sunshine regulations that we need to follow. So um, take it away, Mr. Saunders. Uh, so just so everybody knows, uh, for your benefit, everything that you've said has been recorded 
And so all of your transgressions are now a public record. So <laughs> <laughs> make sure that you do one person here. Sure I had already confessed on a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, my name is Chris Saunders. I'm from Boston. Um, Sorry to hear that. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 uh, and so I have bad news and good news. And the bad news is that I could probably spend forever going over Sunshine Law, public records, and Robert's Rules of Order. Um, that is the bad news. Is you can never cover. You can never spend enough time covering it all. The good news is I'm not going to do that because I was told I have 20 minutes, so you guys won't fall asleep during my presentation. <laughs> so, um, just to start, uh, first of all, congratulations and welcome to all of you for becoming a part of the advisory committee. Um, and what that means is, as some of you may know, is is that you've got a pretty you've got a pretty good job, right? Um, your role is to advise on curriculum content. You are supposed to um, you know, do your best to bring your ideas and your suggestions um, that can be used as recommendations you know, that can be potentially implemented. So um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a responsibility. Um, it's something that is, has been contemplated by your school board and is codified in its policy. So what that means, though, is that you are also kind of an arm of the school board, right? So, so you are you are appointed by your school board members, um, and you essentially have to, uh, I guess, maintain and adopt the, some of the responsibilities that come along with that as well, which is what um, Ms. Dawn is alluding to uh, when we're talking about Sunshine Law, uh, when we're talking about Robert's Rules, when we're talking about public records, when we're talking about ethics. Um, you are, for all intents and purposes, uh, public officials. You're not elected officials. Um, you are, you know, you're, again, your capacity is one of an advisory board. So, you know, so your actions are not final. That, you know, that rests, that, that authority rests with the board, with the school board. Um, but you still have to conduct yourselves in very, in very much the same way as school board members. Um, so, the, the policy uh, 1.20, which I think you all have, and you don't need to, Look at it, um, you know, in detail right now. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to to, uh, to go home and, and read it. Um, it outlines how you how you can be appointed. It outlines what your what your role and your purpose is as a committee. Um, and the the policy itself also outlines a number of other uh, you know uh, responsibilities that you have. Particularly if you look at the first the first part of the first section, um, it talks about. Uh, the way um, so each committee, as, as Ms. Vaughn would want to do naturally, which makes perfect sense, each committee has a chair and a vice chair, right? So the role of the chair uh, and the vice chair are to conduct, uh, to conduct the meetings. Your, your, your role as a chair or, or a vice chair, if the chair is absent, is really to make sure that the business of the committee gets done. So uh, that can mean anything from uh, meeting with your school board liaison to to staff to you know figuring out what your agenda is going to look like um, to the literal nuts and bolts of running the meeting from you know from start to finish it as it um, uh, as it arises. So normally, what what will happen? That's one of the first uh, that's one of the first responsibilities as a committee is you've got to elect your chair, you've got to elect your vice chair, um, and the chair typically uh, will take over. Once you know, once the meeting's ready to start, <coughs> and you will go through the agenda, and you will have to, uh, you know, deal with votes as they come up. Um, you may have to deal with, uh, you know, other other responsibilities or any issues that come up in terms of, you know, someone speaking out of turn. Um, you know, potentially, you know, if, if you've got, uh, you know, somebody that comes to your meeting and is kind of going off topic, and you need to redirect. Those are some of the responsibilities that that a person can have as chair, and. Vice chair can also have you know bearing responsibilities that you know that the committee may want to give the vice chair, but typically the most important role is if the chair's not there, you're in the saddle. Um, so those are a couple of the you know a couple of the main points about uh, you know the organization of the committee. Make sure I don't have time. Um, and one of the other important things, or two of the two of the other important things that the committee has to make sure that they do is set their meeting dates. Um, committees have uh, a, a specific 
uh, number of meetings in which they have to convene. Um, and that's also, that's in your policy in 1.20. Um, the second thing that, that committees will do, and this is typically something that usually ends up being done by the chair, but it can be done by the vice chair or whoever is designated, is to provide quarterly reports to the, to the board. Um, the, the, a report is generated, um, and then typically at um, either, you know, at a meeting that, you know, that, that works best for the school board and works best for staff, um, a committee report will be uh, provided to them so that everybody knows what we're doing. Every, every uh, committee has a school board liaison. The school board liaison is the one that typically ends up getting most involved with that committee, but not every, not every board member um, you know, has the, has the you know, wherewithal or the time to, to make sure that they can keep up with the, what's going on with each individual committee, because there are several. Um, so the best way to do that is to provide a quarterly report. So there's communication, everybody knows what's going on, and other board members have the opportunity to, to understand you know, the, work, the great work that you guys are doing. Um, let me see. So, like I said, um, you know, it, it's 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 really, I mean, in my my personal opinion, and I've served on committees myself. It's it's really it's really a privilege to be able to, to do something like this. Um, you know, to get the opportunity to you know to bring your ideas and contribute um, in a way that you know that might be impactful. But the state of Florida um, is is really, really focused on making sure that everybody does that um, in, in a way that they feel is as transparent as possible, which is why there are lots of rules about how you guys can conduct your business and how you have to conduct yourselves, right? So one of those, uh, one of those pillars that you really have to pay attention to is, um, is ethics, right? So chapter uh, chapter one twelve uh, of Florida statutes. Uh, you know, honestly, it really boils down to, you know, I think, you know, making sure that you've got, you know, that you have the best interest of the of the committee and the school board and the district at heart. Um, that's really what it comes down to. Um, but there are specific things that you know that I want to let you guys know about that you want to make sure that you. Uh, you know, that you're mindful of. Um, one of the biggest would be conflicts of interest. Um, there's going to be, there are going to be items that come before you that you're going to have to make a decision on. Um, and what you want to make sure of is that when you do so, uh, when you cast your vote, that the only thing on your mind is the mission of the committee. Um, so if you are a part of a business or you run a business, um, you know, that may have some interest in uh, benefiting from your vote on something that's coming before your committee, don't vote on it. Don't, right? Because even if you do have the, you know, the best interests of the committee and the school board at heart, um, you know, it can look like, you know, to, you know, to the Commission on Ethics that you are just voting, you know, for something that's going to benefit your business, right? Or is going to benefit you in some way, right? So when, when things like that come up, uh, you know, where you think you might be towing the line between being a committee member and being something else, you know, the goal is when you're here, the only thing that you care about is, is the committee. The only thing that's on your mind when you vote is the committee. So that's what, you know, when you're talking about a conflict of interest, those are some of the things that you want to make sure that you look out for. Uh, also, uh, you know, things like this happen. And it's not, it's not a bad thing, right? I mean, if, you know, if you own a business, if you, you know, if you're, you know, part of, you have an ownership stake in something, you know, that's, you know, that's obviously, uh, you know, that's, that's your right to do so. Um, sometimes there are, you know, limits. Sometimes there are disclosure, um, you know, disclosure requirements that you'd have, you know, that you need to have, um, you know, that may, that may be enough, right? So if you've got a question um, about whether or not you should just not vote on something, whether or not disclosing it is a good, is, you know, is a good enough idea. Um, you know, you should definitely uh, reach out and ask. Um, in your cheat sheet, there is, you know, a little section on what you can do when it comes to disclosure. Um, and typically, what what we, what we strongly recommend is that you disclose, you know, this potential conflict of interest in writing, um, and you try and do it before the meeting. Uh, you know, if you if you 
see the agenda when you're getting ready for the meeting. Um, you see, oh, you know, this is you know, this is something that might be an issue. We want to try and disclose it beforehand. Um, I will say, and I've seen this happen, you know, and it's something that you know that we think is is okay to do. If you disclose it at the meeting before, you know, before there's a vote, before the before the item comes up, that's fine. Just say, hey, listen, you know, I'm a, I have an ownership interest in such and such. I'm going to abstain from this, uh, you know, and you know, just and leave it at that. Um, you know, that can be okay. Um, does anybody have any questions up to this point before I keep going? All right. This is this is one of the uh, one of the bigger one of the bigger uh, sort of responsibilities that I think um, a lot of a lot of issues can arise out of. So, what's Florida known as? What do we call Florida? Sunshine. Uh, sunshine. Yeah. So, in the esteemed, um, you know. Uh, I guess sense of humor of the Florida legislature, they call the open meetings law the sunshine law, right? So what does the sunshine law mean? The sunshine law means that, or you know, the, the, the genesis of it is to make sure that all business that's done by any public board or committee is done in the sunshine, right? That means everybody can see it. Everybody knows what to do and the public has an opportunity to see what's going on, see what your decisions are, see what's going into your decisions, and to you know support or object it if they want. Um, so that means for all of you that if there is going to be um, you know a meeting, right? There's got to be a few things that you've got to put in place. It's got to be noticed. Uh, you know, there's got to be there's got to be min uh, minutes, um, and there are two or more of you in a room together. If there are, if if there are two more, two or more people discussing committee business, <coughs> that is considered a meeting, right? Which means that it's got to meet the requirements of the sunshine. Which means that if you see each other in Publix, if you see each other in the parking lot, if you see each other in school, please don't talk about anything that would come before the curriculum advisory. Uh, that could be considered a sunshine law violation, and that does have consequences. It can't have consequences. Uh, it can be, it's a misdemeanor. It, could be, it can be up to, I think, a $500 fine, if I remember correctly. I don't think they changed that yet. Um, you know, and, and so it's, it's something that is something that you've got to be mindful of you know, uh, pretty, pretty often, which is why I think it, become, it can be such an issue, right? Because a lot of you, I mean, if you live in the same community, Gonna run at each other. I mean, if you got kids that are, you know, three and one, I'd probably see you in a soccer game. My kids are three and one and a half, like, you know, like, you know or like we'd be, you know, we'd be in some place, you know, together where you, where you may run into each other. So you got to be mindful of that. Doesn't mean that you can't show up at a Christmas party together. Doesn't mean that you can't talk to the other person. It just means that if it's about committee business, it's off limits. Okay. Um, let me make sure. That, uh, all right, so I'm going to touch a little bit on uh, kind of like the corollary to that, which is public records. Um, so public records are basically any document that has to do with your committee business, right? Um, and that means emails, text messages. Um, it can mean Facebook posts. It can mean what you throw up on Twitter. Please don't DM somebody about a decision that you were going to make about, you know, on the curriculum advisory, <laughs> right? Like, you know, it can be any of those things. Basically, a public record is is just that. It's something that can be, upon request, available to the public for them to review, right? Um, and so you may, as committee members, run into somebody who might be curious about something that's going on. Um, at the you know at the curriculum advisory committee, and they may want to know you know uh, what was said about this matter, what was said about you know the decision you know the decisions were made at the last meeting. Um, if anybody asks, and it is deemed a public record, we have to turn it over. We have to turn it over in a reasonable amount of time. What does that mean for all of you? If somebody comes to you with a public records request, and keep in mind it does not have to be in writing, um, the best thing you could probably do is reach out to staff 
and staff can help to kind of guide and facilitate the process because there is a process. Um, just because you have an email about some, you know, something that has to do with committee business, if there's other things in the email that might be considered exempt from public records, that might be something that can be redacted or needs to be redacted for one reason or another before the public record gets turned over. Um, so I say that to say, uh, you know, as committee members, you know, you want to you want to walk with that in mind, um, you know, with the emails that you send. Um, you know, and with the text messages that you send, um, you know, a lot of us do almost all of our work by email now. You know, and you know, far be it from me. I try to pick up the phone as much as I can, but I'm really pro and I really have fast thumbs now. So you know, it's something that everybody has to deal with. Um, there's in your sheet sheet. There's a little bit of a section on public records uh, for that. If you guys have any questions about any of any of these things, I have a question. So there, within this group, there are staff members here that serve the school district. How do those rules apply to them? I mean, right. So we don't know. That's a good thing for me to know. <laughs> so the public records laws would apply to staff, but in terms of sunshine. They are not voting members of the committee. So um, they can so. discuss curriculum in your own little offices. Thank you. That's correct. And, <laughs> yes. and you can, and, oh, I'll get right to you. And you can discuss, you can discuss with staff members as well. You individually can stuff, can discuss with staff members as well. That is not a meeting. The Sunshine Law applies to you, to this body, right? So if you were to meet with Ms. Vaughn, She's not a member of the school board. She's a member of the school board. She's not a member of the curriculum advisory committee. She is okay. a school board member. So you can meet with her as well. Any of you can meet with her. I wouldn't I wouldn't have two of you meet with her, but I but well, one of you. Uh, I would take them and then I will. Me? Yeah. Okay. I, I think I misheard what you just said, and that that's people who are on staff in the County School are non-voting members of this committee. I know there's some administrators who are on here who are not voting members, but they're also teachers and it's just us. So, so there are staff committee. members. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's just us because we're the right, we're right. the staff liaisons. That's what I understood, but I'm not sure that was the question. So I think I meant the, any staff, you're right. You, yeah, I thought so. And so, so I just wanted us to clarify that the teachers there are some are lay, lay people, citizens, um, are not working for or employed by the school district, but there are a number of people who are on this committee who are employed by the school district who are voting members. Right, employed by the school district and voting members. So your question is whether or not the Sunshine Law would still apply? No, it's just, I think this lady was asking a question and I don't think she got the answer right. that she right. was right. accurate for what your question okay. was. So that means there are some of these people who are on staff mm -hmm. Outside of the administrators, right. we also can't speak to you because that would be violating the Sunshine Law. You can't speak about committee. Uh, about yeah, That's I know correct. I can speak to yes. it, but not about. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, so I I agree with the distinction. <laughs> I think that's a great point, and I apologize for not. Oh don't about that. no. Um, but yes, so when I mean when I mean staff liaison, I mean the staff liaisons. You can you can talk to the staff liaisons. I apologize. I should have been more specific. Um, Oh, you had a question. I just, I just told bring this up. I was with this committee for about eight years, and by far the biggest break of the sunshine law was right after the meeting. People walked out and talked. Right? <laughs> <laughs> two of them, or two or more, would come up to me with some questions and want to discuss something that happened at the meeting. And you know, I felt really bad about saying I can't do that with two of you here, or three of you here, but. So it's not the staff being rude or anything. I mean, they really can't do that. What's that gal was down at the meetings adjourned. So it's, uh, but I, and I caught myself sometimes uh, getting involved in that process and say, oh, I, I, wait a minute, I can't talk to people about it, even though you've been with them one minute earlier. You know, so it's, uh, it's not easy. It's, it's really not. Seriously, it's incredibly natural. It is incredibly natural. natural. Um, you know, you guys are going to do. You guys are going to be working together. Um, you know, and you may work. You may quite literally work together in, in individual schools. It's it's not easy at all, which is why I say it's something to be mindful of, um, to try and continue to be mindful. Of. But this this is local boards, the local elected officials. Um, you know, everybody across the state, uh, you know, has the has the same challenge. You're not alone in, in finding it being, you know, somewhat difficult. 
I have some subcommittees that try their best to, you know, to adhere to the Sunshine Law, but they get really frustrated when they've got plans or discussions, you know, that they may have individually that, you know, could benefit the rest of the committee, and they really want to have them so that they can come, you know, so they can move business along a lot quicker than having to wait until they all get together in the meeting and they get so upset. But I didn't write the law, so. <laughs> um, the last thing that I'm going to cover, and I have seven seconds to do it, so I apologize. <laughs> um, the last thing I'm going to cover uh, very quickly is Robert's Rules of Order. This is how you actually get done. So, the school board has adopted uh, Robert's Rules of Order. Um, Robert's Rules of Order is a set of rules that helps to move business along. It helps to govern meetings. Um, it was invented by a guy named Henry Roberts, uh, who, if I remember correctly, was an alum of the Citadel. So, naturally, he really liked rules. <laughs> um, and for some reason, like, like figuring out how people ran meetings was his thing, right? So. So he ends up going all around the country and, and observing meetings and seeing how people like conduct their meetings. Finds out that everybody's doing their own thing. And he's like, this is absolutely like unacceptable. Like I'm going to figure this out. So he drafts um, his first version of Robert's Rules and nobody wants to publish it because it was so thick and so voluminous and I'd imagine so incredibly boring that nobody was like, I, this is not happening. So he ends up publishing himself. Lo and behold, this is what, like 200 years later, it's one of the most popular ways to govern meetings. There are other ways, there are other types of rules, but Robert's Rule is by far and away the most popular, at least in the United States. Um, so quick tenets of Robert's Rules, you know, it, the, the goal is to make sure that everybody gets a voice, make sure that everybody has the opportunity uh, to be heard, it's supposed to give order um, to the meeting, attempt to give order to meetings, um, and really to get business done. So by get business done, I mean that, like I said, Robert's Rules is extremely voluminous, but the, the substance should outweigh the form, right? So if the rules are like getting in the way of business getting done, that's not what they're for, right? And so usually the way that, that it works is you need the more like intense versions of Robert's Rules, the bigger the committee is, right? So if you're talking like the state, like the legislature or Congress, then you're probably sitting there with like the extra full version, like the 90th of edition or whatever, right? So, but for smaller committees, for smaller boards, you need, you need, you need less. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is just real quickly um, talk a little bit about some of the motions that you will use in order to get business done. Um, so, like I said, the role of the chair is to call the meeting to order. Right? One of the other goals, uh, like I said, for the chair is to make sure that you preserve decor. Right? And uh, I would say probably the, the most common role for the chair um, is the final thing, which has to do with you know the, the passing of, of motions, right? Getting getting one done. Uh, Robert's rules typically says that you need a majority, um, you know, of, of members to you know to pass a motion. Um, sometimes a supermajority, but that's something that's usually either you know explicitly outlined. It would be something that was in a policy we saw it, or something that was in state law. If if something like that were to come up, um, and. Basically, what would happen is, you know, say we've got, you know, say we've got a motion to, you know, we've well, we've got an agenda item on the, you know, on the agenda to, uh, I don't know, include like Twitch in like every classroom or include like Snapchat, like every every you know every student in the district has that like Snapchat for whatever reason. We would ever want that to happen. <laughs> um, you know, if that was, you know, if that was the will of the committee, um, you know, the way that it would work is. You know, you've got the agenda item. The chair would the chair would announce whatever the agenda item is. Um, technically, there's supposed to be a motion and a second, and then you open it up for discussion. What usually happens is uh, you you have the chair announce the agenda item, and then there's a discussion, and then there's the vote. Right. Um, like I said, the form and the substance. Right. So if you know lots and lots and lots of smaller boards 
we'll have the discussion first. And that, you know, that's fine. You know, I think that that's fine. Um, so say we've got this, you know, we've got this Snapchat agenda item, you know, and, and um, you know, Christina makes a point about, you know, what, what it was that she thought was a good thing for, it to, you know, why it's a good thing. Um, somebody else, you know, says, you know, they don't think it's a good thing. There's a discussion. Um, usually what the chair tries to do is, you know, make sure, first of all, that everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, the rules, again, technically say that nobody should speak more than twice on the same, on the same item. Um, you know, that's, that's something that's at the discretion of the chair to enforce. Um, once everybody has spoken, then the chair will call the vote. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can vote. Uh, the most common way is a roll call. Um, but depending on what it is that you're doing, especially if it's something like administrative, like you're trying to set a calendar or whatever, you can do something that's either called a consensus or a voice vote, which is, you know, you know, the chair will be like, do I, you know, do I have consensus? And you can either thumbs up or thumbs down, or the most common is a yay or a nay, right? So how many yays, you know, you count the yays, and then how many nays, right? You count the nays. Something like that is usually, you know, a consensus is usually used for administrative stuff, not something that's on the agenda that would actually call for like the approval or denial. Um, the second, that's, so that's the way that a most, the most common sort of use of Robert's rules that you, that you will find. Um, but let's, let's take the Snapchat example. I'm regretting that I came up with it, but I'm going to roll with it because, <laughs> uh, and say, um, what was your name? Oh, no, I didn't. No, what was your name? My name's Jonathan. Jonathan. Okay. okay. So say Jonathan wants to amend this, this, uh, this Snapchat, uh, this Snapchat proposal. Um, what, what you would do is, you know, if you've got a motion on the floor, um, you make a motion to amend the Snapchat proposal to, I don't know, make it only for, you know, high school. Yes, yeah, so that's exactly where I was going. Which <laughs> would be a wise thing to do if you were even going to think about doing this. Um, so if you've, got an, if you've got an amended motion, if you've got a motion to amend something, the way that, the way that Robert's Rules works is almost counterintuitive. So you've got your first motion. Right, your motion to approve, you know, the Snapchat, you know, for all the students. The amended motion is becomes the more important motion. Why? Because you've got to amend, you've got to make a decision about whether or not you want to change the main motion first before you vote on the main motion. Right. Um, there's a couple of ways that I've seen the amendment process work. Um, a lot of times, you know, the motion to amend will be made, and then the uh, you know the person that made the motion can accept it, um, and if they say you know I accept your your you know your they call it a friendly motion, which that's a nerd I, the nerd in me has a little issue with that, um, but if that happens, then the motion becomes amended, and then the, the committee would vote on the, the motion as it's amended. Formally, what I believe is supposed to happen is you should take a vote, have a majority vote on the amended motion, find out what that is. And if the amended if the amended motion is approved by the committee, then you have the amendment, and then you uh, vote on the main motion. What? Wait a minute. Right. Back up. Yes, that's why. That's why. That's why people usually do the friendly, you know, the acceptance or the denial. Right. And usually the vote, the vote for the amended motion usually occurs when the maker of the original motion does not want the amendment. And then you got to find out whether or not the majority of the committee. Or you could have a parliamentarian and forget the whole thing. And you let could the do that. You do certainly it. could do that. But most, I think that a lot of most of committees that I've seen, most boards that I've seen, most of the local elected and local governments don't have a parliamentarian. So um, you're elected. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, but like most, like most cities and counties, like they, you know, or, or uh, you know, uh, agencies, public agencies, they won't, they won't have a parliamentarian to to make that call. So you have to follow the, the, uh, the way that Robert's rules work. So I have a little cheat sheet, and the cheat sheet in there, I put a little bit about amendments in there. Well. You, um, you can still um, have somebody propose something, discuss it, and then do the motion at the end of the discussion, right? That's correct. And so that that's cuts correct. Cuts out all of that other. Right. So so <laughs> if what you're saying is, you know, if you have somebody that wants to amend a motion, you know, you have you have a you know a motion to amend. A second, then you have discussion. Do we, do we want this amendment? Do we not want this amendment? Mm -hmm. right. okay. And then you go, you have a gray and a on that, and then you go back to the main motion. Right. And, and then you can make your decision there. Usually I advise on a roll call vote when you're doing stuff like that. <laughs> Just so you know where everybody stands. 
so I apologize this, uh, for going over uh, my time. Uh, does anybody have any questions at all about uh, Robert Schools or such about public meetings or how you're organized? No? I have one question. It's not about Robert Schools, it's about uh, the Sunshine Law sure. and the transparency issue. Sure. When I became a member last year, um, I was told that my name and home address and everything was being provided to the newspaper because they requested it. And I didn't know if, if that's something, be, when you're on a committee like this, you give up that level of privacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. um, there are, um, depending on your, and it would be tricky because, because you're on a committee, but depending on your like your employment, right? So if you are uh, a law enforcement officer, mm -hmm. um, you know there are some exemptions for certain right. information that you wouldn't necessarily be privy to if you were just you know if you're a teacher you know, right. or if you're an administrator. Um, so there are some exemptions for that. But generally, is a home address is public. Yeah, it is. I know. But if you think about it, you can go and pop property appraiser's website know somebody's name you can find out where they live anyway um, so you know that's part of that is is just I think a nature of the way that the system is set up here I was just trying to figure out why the newspaper wanted it um, that's an interesting question I'm not sure why they would um, but as a member as long as as long as what the record is relates to the business of the committee they have pretty good argument you know that's a public record and that we have to turn it over as long as there's no exemptions. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, I know I sufficiently bored you, but you did not fall asleep, so thank you all. Um, congratulations. I hope you guys have an awesome year. Um, and if you guys have any questions at all uh, about what we went over, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. Staff knows how to get a hold of me. Um, I'm not sure about contact information, for which I apologize, but you know, if you give them a ring, um, they would certainly shoot me an email or give me a phone call. All right, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you can do that. Yeah. Just type in things. No, that's on tape. Yeah. 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 One thing that I want to call your attention to, and um, I'm not sure why it's not in policy, but if you look at the cheat sheet that you have, uh, those of you who are, have been on the committee, you know about the attendance rules. But I want wanted to point that out. It's um, the second bullet point under organization on the cheat sheet. A member who has three absences during the school year will be removed from membership. Well, we, we have just seven meetings a year, and you get two absences, and there aren't excused absences or phone-ins or anything like that. It's just the way it is, because um, I think several years ago, we didn't have rules like that, and I remember being, as, before I was on school board, coming to an advisory committee meeting, and we didn't have a quorum, and people weren't there, and, and so it's just a little more, I guess you could say, incentive for people to actually come here. And I know I had to ask Helen, I, I didn't even see at the bottom of the sheet, does everybody see that the dates are on there? And um, I don't know, I think last year, we usually kind of take a while to ruminate over these different dates and make sure it's not a holiday, a school holiday, or, or something like that. So hopefully, because we really worked on that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, hopefully these are good, and we're in this room all year, right? I think so. yes. We're in this room all year. So I did want to point that out. And one other thing um, regarding the absence, just because you watch it on TV doesn't count as <laughs> here, but um, if you do need to be absent, I think this is one of the benefits of having the televised meetings. And again, these are not streaming, right? They're on YouTube. Yes. Correct. Correct. Lee School YouTube. So if you want to see yourself or maybe oh, you're not even 
in the view of the camera, but it's it's really a very good way to, if you miss a meeting, to keep up with what was going on. And secondly, I know myself as a school board member and several of the rest of us, it's it's really a great tool for us too, um, because you know we can really get the scoop on what happened at the various other meetings. So everybody understand, after your second absence, you're absent a third time, then it's no offense, but it's you're, you're off the committee. Yes. Betsy, just to clarify, before, if we had to be absent, we were allowed to call in. Is that no longer acceptable? As far as I know, it's not. Do you know? It's not acceptable. But that was cleared up last year. I right? thought so. I believe so. I mean, we can double check. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll double check that for you. And again, we'll have to check out yeah. why it's not in policy. But um, yeah, all of these issues have come up in, in the past. And um, you know, as I said, there's seven meetings. Yeah. It would just be nice to have that clarification because yeah. it was allowed last year, and if that is not policy this year, then it would be good to know that. I will check it out Thank and you, let you know. All right. Um, we'll, we'll yeah. I'll, let, I'll let you know. All right, so what I would like to do now is open the floor for nominations for chairperson and who would like, and we'll do, we nominate, we make a motion for whoever you want to be chairperson, it'll be the second, and then we'll see if there are other nominations, and then we'll vote. So who would like to make a nomination? Who wants to make a motion? Or you can nominate yourself. <laughs> we do it verbally or yeah. we do it verbally? Yeah, ver verbally. And, and I do want to say that um, what Mr. Saunders said is, is true. There is a little bit of work, um, but it's great work because you get to meet with me and <laughs> lovely ladies here. And you're going to be You're not. 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 you are not 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 you you don't want to do this. Let's you understand the responsibility. Then. Okay. The responsibility is to meet with the staff mm -hmm. and form the agenda or whatever else. <coughs> mm -hmm. And that entails another meeting a month. Not always. We had a couple times where we actually Emailed it back. We, we emailed back and forth a few times when we couldn't meet with the chair. Mm -hmm. The chair last year was a teacher on at Sanibel. Okay, so it was that's very hard, hard yeah. for him to get out here, and so we worked it out a few times through email and mm -hmm. as well as with um, yeah. And, and so sometimes it can be worked out that way. Yeah. And also, it seems to me that it might have been toward the end of the year. We had a lot that we wanted to put on the agenda, and so at one meeting worked out. For the they rest of the year, the next, yes. and so, but I just wanted to put it out there just so you know. And, and there is a vice chair, too. If we're able to, as a committee, decide what our topic is that we are going to work on, and then build that, then, we, then that, that, that becomes a little. Meetings, because then it's just back work on our part. And you will doc, uh, uh, generate the memos or the dittos or the whatever. Okay. Oh, yeah, emails yeah. I'm telling all the time. I know. Thank you. You're saying <laughs> dittos. You do not need to type up anything. Keep that's that's yes. Yes. just so we see us. There is one, two other meetings though because the chair of each of the board committees meet with the superintendent and then uh, present to the board. So you meet with the superintendent and he does it really early. I think we met at like 7.30. To ensure 7 a.m., something like that, so that you know everybody had to miss work. Um, and then the board day, it's during a it's during an action meeting, an action meeting in the at two o'clock. It's not or is it a briefing? No, yeah, I don't know. but it's the it's the during the day meeting, it's not the six o'clock meeting. Okay, but then it's a briefing meeting. 
Well, I would volunteer for either and whoever else volunteers the time. Okay, okay so, so who would please. like to, I've got to see names. Christine, are so. you volunteering? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Stephanie Snyder, who, she nominates herself. I don't and, know. And who wants, wants to, to second that? I'll second that. All right. So Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> I wanted you to. I'll be the silent partner. Seconded by, say your name. So you can't Helen talk to me. Uh, Jonathan Highland. Okay. You can't talk okay. to me. So we have Stephanie. All right. Who has another nomination? nomination? I, I'd like to nominate Dr. Wilkerson. And I'll second it. All right. Okay. So that is. Dr. Judy Wilkerson, and that was seconded by April and Erica. We need a motion. We have two nominations. Do we have any more nominations for chairperson? Okay. Do, yes. Hi. <laughs> what? Uh, hi, Mar Marissa Byer. Okay. I'm nominating myself. Marissa. Marissa okay. Byer. Yeah. Marissa. E Y E R. Yes. Marissa. And who will second that nomination? I'll second. Okay. And seconded by Sophia Wirtz. Okay. We I have three. Does anybody else want to nominate before we have a discussion? Is there. We have another one. Nope. No, no move moving. nominations be closed. I second it. All right. Any discussion? All right. Do you do we do? Yep. We on secret ballots before? Or just I'm in end discussion. I would end discussion. Do we have? That's what I said. Is there any discussion? I motion to end, to end discussion. I make a motion to end discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I second. I asked. Is there any discussion? No. no. Who has discussion? I, I'd like to yes. just specify that I'd like to nominate Dr. Wilkerson because she has experience in this committee and has been for a number of years. Okay. Got okay. Who else has discussion? I yes. withdraw my nomination <laughs> because I would rather it be a person who was on the committee. So that's great. You're welcome. Okay. Dr. Stephanie's off that. Other discussion? Okay, do you mind if we, shall we close, who moves that we close discussion and vote? Anybody? A motion to move. Okay, so moved agree, by second. Erica and seconded by? Jonathan. 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 Okay, so, is show of hands okay? Show of hands is fine. All right, Judy Wilkerson, please vote. Two, three, four, five, six for chairperson. For chairperson. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve and for Marissa. Eleven. Okay. Oh, eleven. Did you I voted for I don't think we need to do a count, do we? We just need to close. Do we need to do a count for your notes. And and Mr. Roberts and 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 yeah, yeah, we're doing okay. okay. All right, so Judy Wilkerson will be the chairperson. And I'll finish this out, and then Dr. Wilkerson is going to be taking over in just a minute, so get ready. Uh, vice chair, open for nominations. Yes, I move that we have Marissa become the vice chair. Yeah. I, I second. second it. Okay, so um, Stephanie Webb and then Ruth Ann. I second it. Mar How do you say her last name? Marlowe. Marlowe. Okay, seconds for Marissa. Other nominations for vice chair? Okay, who moves that we close nominations? I know. Jonathan. I move that we no close nominations. And second? second. All right. Who votes for Marissa? Everybody. Oh. Um, so, uh, Marissa Meyer yes. is now the vice, vice chair. chair. 
And I have to turn this over to Judy. Thanks to all your confidence in me. Unless we talk about the register. Yes. No, I don't. Um, I will confess to you that I do not know Robert's rules well at all. So, Marissa, you're in charge of that. We can do two. We can do two. We can do Okay, well, welcome everyone to this new year. Um, I will do my best to represent you well and to make this a very useful committee. Those of you who know me from the past and stuck your hands up probably did so because you've heard me on so many occasions saying that we need to do things that matter and that really help this district succeed even more than it already succeeds. Um, just a word or two about myself. I do teach at Florida Gulf Coast University. I am a full professor of research, evaluation, assessment, that whole suite of things, which means I am really dedicated to data-driven decision-making. I'm also very, very dedicated to continuous improvement, quality assurance, work hard in the area of accreditation, which kind of epitomizes that. So my motto, credo, whatever, and what I do at my work is we do a great job at FGCU, but we can always do better. And I hope that we can apply that kind of philosophy to where we are here in the school district. I know Lee County Public Schools does a phenomenal job, but no one is perfect. So our goal is to help the district find little small ways that we can do better in ways that they think are important. We serve as an advisory group, and so we need to know and work hard with the district, both the board and the staff, to find out things that they think we can help them with, because ours is, a, in my view, a helping role. So if I'm saying anything that doesn't resonate with you, this would be a really good time to kind of go there. That makes some sense. It's kind of a, okay. All right, so now you know a little bit about me, and I think I am supposed to follow the agenda. Um, like I said, I'm not really wonderful with Robert's rules. So the agenda uh, is for reading and approval of the agenda for tonight, which is what we all have in our hands. So I'd like you to take a look at it, and then I guess I need a motion to approve the agenda. I make a motion to approve the agenda as it's presented. Second. Okay. And do we have any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? How am I doing on Robert's rules so far? We're doing good. All right. So that was excellent. We spent less than two minutes on that one, so we're doing good. Uh, reading and approval of the minutes. I know this is a little challenging because many of you were here last time. But do we want to? Take a minute and read it silently. 30 seconds, especially those of you who were here before. Chair, I make a motion. I move to accept the minutes as presented. Okay. Okay. Who's, who's seconded? I don't know. Matthew. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No abstentions. All right. We're just clicking right along here. <laughs> Review of the mission statement. We do this at every meeting, so it's on the top of the agenda. Let's just read it silently. Kind of look up when you're done reading it. We all are okay with what our mission is. Okay, good time. Um, we don't have any public to comment, so we'll kind of skip that. 
Am I supposed to get approval if it's going to be flying before the word is in the Okay. You can see I don't have a lot of confidence in myself to do Okay. Board member report. Good, I can just stop again. No, no, not for long because we um, really don't have anything um, new or exciting to report. Um, Stay tuned for next month, though. Come on, something good. Well, we're really making good time here. Okay, so. Yeah, well, Mr. Saunders used the wrong time. Okay. So, now we get to something important. And I missed your name, and I am so sorry. Ryan Libby. Ryan Libby. Ryan Libby. Okay, so, Ryan, I think you're going to make a presentation for us. We are going to make it. Some of the time. And last year, this is kind of where we left off. It was not that we were going to start with some data, and just for the benefit of those of you who were not with us, and for those of you who were, correct me if I mess up, um, we had decided that it would be really good to kind of dig our uh, teeth into the data and have the district help us to see some issues that they would like to have some thoughts from this committee about, and so you're going to steer us in that direction now. Yeah, right? we Tell are. You. We're going right, to share you. with you some really high-level positives on all the work that we accomplished last year, but you're also going to note some areas of focus that we have. And if any of you also happen to serve on DAC, I do apologize. This is the same presentation we gave DAC, because we thought it would be really important for you all to see that same exact presentation. So if you're getting to hear it for a second time, just kind of indulge me. And if it's the first time, I hope you enjoy. We're taking the show on the road this month. Um, Dr. Spiro is sorry he cannot be here. He's actually with the executive DAC committee this evening. Normally, he will be with us as well. Um, Dr. Ritson also sends his regrets for not being able to be here. So you've got Ryan and I tonight. So some of the pieces we're going to cover is who counts for our school grade, how is it actually calculated, where does it come from that the state gets and gives our schools a school grade. So in order for students to count in our district grade, they must be in the district for both October's FTE and February's FTE, and they must be here on the first day of testing. So that's a really important rule for us. So that's them counting in the district. For a school, it follows the same rules. They have to be in the school in October and February. But if I have April, who is at Lehigh Acres Middle in October, and then goes to Harnes Marsh Middle in January, she's not going to count for either of those school grades, but she still counts for our district because she was here with us for the district. So that becomes a question that gets asked a lot because we are very transient here. So our students move around a lot. So that is those first two bullets that talk about that. The third bullet is our ELL population. So here in Lee County, 12.2% of our students are English language learners, so ELL. So in order for them to count in school grade, they have to be in our schools for two years based upon the date they entered the United States. So we call that the deuce date. So once their date they entered the United States hits two years, then they count in our school grade. They don't count before that except for learning gains. And in learning gains, they count the second year that they have a test score. So as soon as they have two state assessments, they count in the learning gains component for us. So what is actually made up of the state's accountability system? So we have achievement. Achievement is proficiency. So the state is looking at levels three, fours, and fives, and they look at that for four categories, our English language arts, mathematics, science, and social studies. Now for you guys, it's important to know English language arts is third through 10th grade, mathematics, is third through eighth grade, then algebra one and geometry. So those are the areas we hit in mathematics. For science, it is grades five, eight, and then biology. Fifth grade is comprehensive of third, fourth, and fifth grade standards. 
Eighth grade is also comprehensive, earth, life, and physical science, and then you hit biology in high school. For our social studies, it's seventh grade civics, and then typically 11th grade U.S. history. We do have some students who take that in 10th grade, depending upon their profession. So those are all the areas that we look for achievement in. Now for learning gains, the only two places we look for learning gains is in our English language arts assessments and our mathematics assessments, because those are the only two assessments that the students typically take year over year over year. So those are the only two areas that we look at learning gains. Then we have what we call the learning gains of our lowest 25%. So the state has us look very specifically at our students in the lowest 25% and how are those students doing. And again, we only look at those for English language arts and mathematics. Then we look at middle school acceleration. And this is, are we offering high school level EOC courses to our middle school students? So the one that we offer here in Lee County the most is algebra. We have a large cohort of our eighth graders that do take algebra. We do have a much smaller cohort, but there is a cohort of middle school students who are taking geometry this year. And that's based upon our middle school math progression that allows for acceleration there. In middle school acceleration, not only is it high school EOC courses, but it also entails career and technical certification courses. So students who take an industry certification test in middle school and pass it are actually included in there too. The next one is our graduation rate, and I'm very excited to share that. I won't share it because that's like a highlight in Ryan's slide, so I don't want to pull that away from them. You might hurt me if I do that, but that's a high level point for us this year. And then college and career acceleration. This is our senior cohort. So it's lag data because it's not until after those seniors graduate because it is that cohort of students. But it is the opportunity for career and college acceleration, dual enrollment, advanced placement, IB courses, ACE courses, and also your career and technical, those industry certifications. So those are all the pieces that count in college and career acceleration. And again, that's based upon your graduation cohort. Okay? So yes, everything is equally weighted at for a total of 1,100 possible points? As the district grade, yes, absolutely. So the question was, everything's equally weighted for 1,100 points. In the district grade, yes. Now for the school grade, it's only the components that they have. And you have to have a minimum of 10 students to have that component count for you. So these next two graphs I'll move through quickly, but it's just about learning gains. We thought it would be important for this committee to understand how learning gains are actually calculated. Because learning gains are very important to us in moving our students. This is the old model. So this trend line here was a student, April, sorry April, you're up front and I know you, I'm gonna use you all night long. <laughs> April in third grade could have been a level one student. And she made her learning gains every single year because it just used to be based upon a set amount of points. April would reach 10th grade though and she'd still be a level one student. It means she would have left us without being proficient. So four years ago, the state changed what they considered making a learning game. Now we have these buckets. So we have a level one that's broken into a level one A, one B, and one C. So a low, a mid, a high. And then the level two is broken down into two buckets. So now what it means is April, right here again, starts in that level one A bucket and she makes her learning gain each year, but notice what happens now. By the time she hits seventh grade, she's proficient. So this reason is really important. These two graphs illustrate the change in the state for making these bucket adjustments that you often hear educators talk about jumping a bucket, moving a bucket, and it's because we're moving our students towards proficiency. So it helps to ensure that even though a child's making their learning gains, that they are moving towards proficiency. So that just details out this slide here of how students make a learning gain. So they either need to jump up that bucket, so they jump up a level, or if they were already proficient, a level three or four, they have to increase their scale score. And if you're a five, you're at the top, we're just trying to keep you a five. 
because once you reach that five level, it is really hard to maintain that. So that is a little bit of the back history. So when Ryan shares with you the good news that we have to share, is that you see kind of how all of these pieces come together. All right. All right. So before we dive into the data, though, uh, we did receive back uh, an appeal from our school that was uh, received an incomplete uh, Pine Island Elementary, and they've been granted a grade of A B. So that data is not going to be reflected in these slides. We wanted to give you the same exact presentation that DAC got. <clears throat> so what we see here is exactly what Candace just went over. It's the 11 components that comprise of the districts overall grade. As we move on, next slide, we draw your attention specifically to these seven components as they are the highest they have ever been under the new school grade rules. Most notably is going to be our graduation rate, which he just tried to steal from me, as it's actually the highest it's ever been in the district. What's important about that is it's all our students, traditional public schools and charters, which may differentiate from there. So, moving on. <clears throat> One thing we like to look at is comparing us to like districts. So we compare ourselves with the top 10 largest districts in the state of Florida. What we're looking at is the percent of AV schools in these districts. The thing to note is that there are only three districts like us that are higher in their AV percentage than we are. We also like to compare ourselves to our two neighbors, especially because we get those students a lot uh, with how transient we are. Taking it one step further, this is the comparison between 2017-18 and 2017-18 uh, and 18-19 school years, uh, broken down by school into each bucket or each grade that they received. Uh, the most notable thing, is James jumping me ahead, is it that we have no DRS schools. So, I mean, it's a huge accomplishment for East, moving themselves out of D. Very nice. <laughs> Go. <laughs> and then, the slide's not updated to show Pine Island, but they would be included to give us a total of the 96 schools. <clears throat> Taking it a step further, uh, we like to see how uh, these school grades are broken down into the each level, looking at our A, B, and C schools. So broken out by level in elementary, middle, high, and combo, where our combination schools are that unique uh, combination of grades, like your K-8 schools. <clears throat> so looking at the district as a whole, including our charters, uh, 20 schools improved their grade by at least one letter grade. But most notably, Trafalgar Elementary jumped two letter gates, going from a C to an A. Wow. 64 of our schools maintained their grade, and only 10 decreased. Looking at our traditional public schools, 18 of them improved their grade, 55 maintained, and only 7 decreased. Back to Candace. All right, so that gives you the high-level overview <coughs> of our school grades, how they came back, our district grade, our district grade is a B. We are shooting for that A this year, and to move us to that A, we need 31 more points. So we know that's what we need, and that's three more percentage. So we're sitting at 59%, and we need to get to 62 to get back to being an A district. So that's where we're looking at. So now it comes in, what does the data look like that fed into that? So here is a breakdown of our FSA ELA data. So you are able to see how each of our grade levels in that third through 10th grade, how we did in 2018 to 2019, our change and the state's change. So what's really nice as we look at, are we closing the gap? As we move through each of these slides, we can see that while the state went up one here, we went up three. So we're closing it, we're finally back at, we're matching the state here. We'd like to be exceeding the state, but we're at least matching it. Here we went up the same as the state. Here we went up one more. We were up one, but the state went up two. So we like to see in each of these places how we did and where our opportunities are. So you can notice in ELA, an opportunity here, grade nine, we kind of stayed stagnant. Grade 10, we took a drop. This is important to note because these 10th graders, it's a graduation requirement. So it means while they may be moving on to 11th and 12th, what are we doing to help ensure that they're passing, they can retake FSA ELA, 
or we can get them some ACT SAT prep because they can get a concordance score. So we know this is an area of focus. We also know that as we're moving up our ninth graders to 10th graders, we're looking at our intensive reading programs to make sure what's happening in there. For math, we were really excited about our overall. So remember math is third through eighth grade. And you're gonna notice we went up across with the exception of seventh grade. Now seventh grade, we have a story to tell though and our story is really important. We started our middle school math acceleration. So we're pushing kids where they're ready to be. So we have a cohort of students that last year, they may have been grade six students, but they really had taken a grade seven test and your grade seven kids really took the grade eight test. So that leaves a population of students who are sitting in seventh grade math last year who were performing a little under their peers. So we know we have work to do to continue to close this gap. Last year, this group of seventh graders, when they were sixth graders the year before, they were down a minus 12. So while we still see they're down a minus eight, they actually improved a plus four. We don't see that though, because we're still down. So we've got work to do there. When we look at algebra, our end of course assessment here, so this is for first time test takers. That's really important because we've got retakers because it's a graduation requirement here. So we also see that we took a dip here. Again, this is part of our progression swap. So a lot of our kids are taking algebra in eighth grade. So we saw the year prior, our algebra went way up from where we used to be, but then last year we added in more level ones and twos at our high schools. So our math scores are leveling out a little bit based upon that progression piece. But it means we know we have work to do in algebra that we're putting more conceptual pieces in there because of the fact we need to even out. Candace. Yes, ma'am. Is there a two-year algebra class or a double blocked algebra or something like that? So we have what's called algebra 1A, 1B. The problem with algebra 1A, 1B is the NCAA doesn't recognize it for full credit. So for your student athletes, you only get a 0.5, .5 in which case then they don't have their credits they need to also qualify. So in legislation, legislation passed last year, a provision that students should have the opportunity to have two years to take the algebra EOC. However, our state lobbyists, our math state lobbying to them, that we need to be able to offer those kids a full credit based upon NCAA. So they're working there. What we do in our district is if a student's coming in and they show gaps, is instead of putting them in algebra as a freshman, we put them in a liberal arts math to help build up those skills and then they take algebra as a 10th grader. If they come in with some gaps and if we go, mm, they could be ready, we double block them within algebra and an intensive math. So in algebra, they're getting the algebra skills. In intensive math, they're getting where are my gaps and how do I build up there? So we do have some of those pieces in place for it. In geometry, you're gonna notice we also dropped. So again, as we're talking about areas for opportunities, we have some growth opportunities here in our two EOC courses. When we look at science, here's our five, eight, and biology. If you look, the state dropped two, and we dropped two in both five and eight. In biology, the state went up two, and we dropped five. So if you notice, for us, a trend last year in science is we dropped across the board. So for curriculum this year, we are laser focused in on science. We're looking at our action plan. We're having conversations with schools. We're offering more inquiry-based um, training to get our kids doing more of those hands-on experiments because we know that allows for more recall. So we are really diving in and going, what do we need to do differently? because it was across the board for us. So while we saw great growth in ELA and math, we've got to balance that scale that we can't drop one subject area while our other two are rising. For civics and for US history, the state didn't see any gains, but we saw one. And then for US history, state saw two, we also saw two. So that is the high level overview of our district grade, our individual school grades, the FSA. We don't need that, we've pointed all of that out. We'll look at pros, but that says questions. <laughs> I promise it does say questions up there. 
So we'll open it up to you guys now for additional questions around the data. Marissa? Just as a um, quick clarification, when a student gets to a level three, they should rise up to four and five. What do we do about the bubble kids? The kids that they they score like year to year they keep scoring like the same score. Like if a kid gets like uh, I'm just gonna throw out a number like a 300, mm -hmm. and then they keep getting that like again and again. They're getting what I call comfortable in a bubble. So right. I because I have ones and twos. I'm basically in the cell 25. I've been that for seven years. So my I have students that they have that potential to go up to a three. And then I see the students, once they get to a three, they're, they're staying there, but that could mean that they're in a bubble and they could start to drop. So that's where we focus in on those learning gains and we use our district resources. So we have, which some of you being part of this committee last year heard about, and those of you haven't, so I'm gonna pretend like you're all new for a moment. We have um, formative assessments that occur twice a quarter and they are dipsticks to help check in where the students are. And then once a quarter, we have a district progress monitoring that is longer to help monitor those pieces. Yeah. So we are constantly trying to push those threes, fours as well. While it would be awesome to watch them jump a whole level, what we try to watch for is that that learning gains, that they at least stay a three. So if mm -hmm. April was a three last year, my goal for her is to still be this three, but I need to increase her scale score. And that's some of the provisions that the state put in place is yeah, it's awesome that April's a three, but she should still keep gaining. So I need to increase her scale score. When that changes slightly is when our students go from taking an FSA assessment to an EOC. So like the algebra test, because those scales are different. Once you reach an algebra, a geometry, um, then you just need to maintain because those scales look different. But we are constantly, to answer your question, looking at those data. And then from a district level, we're diving in where are the standards we're dropping and are we dropping students? We've watched previously, um, as Dr. Tien can attest to, for a while our district dropped our reading courses. So we saw a nice increase and then we dropped our reading courses and we watched 30% of, of our students fall because they were just getting ELA instructions. So we've include, included them back now. This is our third year of having those courses back and all students, regardless of the level, take a reading in course. And that's to help provide those reading instruction and make sure our students are not slipping backwards because it's very easy to lose sight of a three, four, and five as we're working on closing the gap for our ones and twos. So that's what those checkpoints are. So kind of it's like they have the assessments. district formative is done. We have checkpoints where they mm -hmm. keep them within those measures. Also worth noting on the scale, as you stay at level three and mm -hmm. go up in, in grade, the scale moves up. So that's what though, I mean. Yeah, yeah. So even though they're, you know, a three hundred, if they maintain that three, they're well above the three hundred now mm -hmm. because they, to maintain it, you got to increase your scale score. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that they're still moving, just not that huge bucket jump that they're getting mm -hmm. in the ones and twos. I saw Donna, then Dr. Sheehan, and then Matthew. I was curious if there's any correlation between the fact that we were not able to get our new textbooks last year, that because the state wanted everybody put on hold for new purchases, does it? Is that going to hold us back again this year and have the same type of issues? Hopefully not. We saw really good gains last year in math across the board with the implementation of the curriculum maps and instructional guides that we were able to share with this committee. And for our folks who are new, we'll make sure you also get to see what those resources look at like. So based upon this committee's recommendation with helping we held on textbook adoption, we had a curriculum workforce that came in of well over a thousand teachers right. to look at our instructional guides, do some more enhancements, and out of all of that, we've developed what we call leading and learning teams. So once a quarter, we bring down, we have a total of 34 teams, each grade level, each content, 919 teachers that come to this building 
and they receive content professional development focused in on the standards. So that way, even though our materials are outdated, right. we're still pushing forward. Oh, so, and that's where Lori is tonight. The reason Lori's not with us is we have middle school leading and learning teams here diving into curriculum this evening to make sure we are still pushing forward and that we haven't reached a glass ceiling because those were increases were nice last year. So now we got to make sure we break through and keep on going. Dr. Tian? I just had a question. Maybe it's for Ryan. Mm -hmm. Ryan, uh, we're looking at, first of all, congratulations on your games because games are games. That means, you know, new bar teachers and administrators are working on it. I noticed that the 42% is stable on students under the, the 25th percentile. In other words, it's been that score for three years. Um, but in relation to scaled scores, do we have, have we looked at the students at each grade level that below a certain scale score, whatever it is, those students don't make games? Uh, so I know looking at uh, doing all the analysis year over year, um, 1As, 1Bs, 1Cs, they all have high gains um, just by the nature of being divided into three sub-levels like that. Uh, where we have the biggest opportunity is our 2Bs. Uh, they are across the, the what, eight levels. Mm -hmm. They are the hardest piece to move, make that jump from 2B to proficient. Um, but the, the lower buckets, they, uh, they're where we get some of our greatest gains, as well as our uh, level three students. They actually make the highest gains of the um, Let me just make a comment. Go ahead. Sure. We also saw that as well, too. So one of the tasks Ryan and I have been looking on are knowing we need 31 points. So that's a lot of points. Where can we get those points from? Where have we been making those gains? And one of the things we said we'd like to engage the principals around conversation next month in October is that same piece. We noticed we've stayed stagnant at 42. Had the old school grade rules been in place where you were below 50 in your L25, a lot of our schools would have dropped a letter grade because that is our population that's not moving. So we actually made it our goal as we're looking at where can we capitalize on some points and we need to make our target for our L, our lowest 25% at least 50%. So we're gonna bring back old school grade rules and say at each one of your building and as a district, how do we move that needle a little bit more? What are our systems that we're missing to get those students moving a little bit? Because we've noticed that same exact piece, we haven't moved in our L25s. Dr. Wilkerson, he had a question. Still. Yeah, so I Before we ask that question, um, I don't know, somebody said I have to be the bad mama or whatever um, in these meetings. Don't we need to have a motion to extend this meeting by about maybe 15 minutes so that we can keep this conversation going because we are rapidly approaching 7.30 and I think we have a wonderful opportunity to talk. I don't know if you have other plans for the evening, but we're supposed to go, we're, we're over at 7.30, right? Yeah, yes. 7.30 is 7.00. And it's like 7.29 right now. So I'm going to ask for a motion to extend the meeting by 15 minutes. 10 minutes. 10. Is that okay? 10 by 10. 10. I'm sorry? Extend by 10 minutes? 10. Okay. Uh, do we hear a second? A second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Abstain? Okay. Let's understand what we have ahead. We need to decide what we're going to do next time we meet and make some significant plans for that. I think we've had a phenomenal presentation by district personnel and they have done exactly what we asked them to do last year. And I personally want to tell you that I'm just thrilled with what you did. I just think it was an extraordinary um, presentation. The district is doing a phenomenal job. Um, and so just kudos to you. But I also want to allow some of that 10 minutes yep. to think about where we're going to go next. Because I know you did such a good job that it's raising questions and ideas from the committee, which is what you have wanted and what we have all wanted. So, so we'll take Matthew's question and then we'll throw it over to you for discussion. That sounds great. Uh, and my question might roll into uh, the new discussion for next meeting. But uh, it's interesting digging into the data when you look at the, the math and the acceleration in middle school and how you have that gap. 
and we seem to be struggling in science more than anything else. So have we considered the possibility of doing some kind of middle school accelerated science and getting some of those students that are ready pushed ahead a little bit? Because if students aren't ready for algebra in eighth grade, well, they're going to have a really rough time with chemistry in ninth grade. So it's just something to consider that maybe um, we could slow a few students down or speed a few students up in you know, some of the great science. No, I love that idea. We did look at that and some of the curriculum members a few years previously. We used to do comprehensive science in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. They moved two years ago. Last year was our just our second year. That sixth grade now takes earth, um, seventh grade takes life, and eighth grade takes physical, and it is a comprehensive test. We found a large correlation between reading and science. So our students who need some more opportunities for reading, those students take environmental education in ninth grade instead of biology, so they hold for a year, and they don't take biology until they're in 10th grade. That way it tries to look at that, but it would be a conversation to continue, though, as we are looking at other districts around the state to see what are they doing in science, too. But yes, yeah, to answer that. So okay, I'll turn it back If you look at the science, though, on, on page five, we had gone up three points the year prior, and so we're still at one, but then we could be talking about same. anomalies, but we just, and it was odd that, because, that's a big swing in the yeah. math, and if you have that, and you can duplicate that with yeah. another the subject, other, it's worth probably looking at. The other thing that's really unique with science is what she was saying, so in fifth grade, it's, I'm sorry, just two seconds, fifth grade is comprehensive, so um, through our analysis of the assessment, it's actually, it was 45, might have been 48% third and fourth grade standards. Fifth grade teachers do not have time to teach third and fourth grade standards. They only have time to teach fifth grade standards. So third and fourth grade, you know, if you're not leaving those grade levels mastering, third grade does not take a grade for science. It's only a for you. How do you how well do you think those teachers, you know, um, mm -hmm. science to the fidelity of the rigor of the science standards? So we've put a lot of um, different things in the place this year that we talked about. And with great success. Okay. So I, for me, the first question is, next time we meet, do you want to continue with this, or do you want to start something new? I hope I know the answer to that question, but I feel like I should ask it. Do you want to continue with this, or do you want to start something new? Continue, continue with this being assessment? Yeah. Yes, continue with this conversation that we started tonight and start to yes. work through um, the district needs with the personnel who are here and use our expertise, ideas, to try and help. Question, Stephanie, uh, Judy. Um, in the minutes, it talked about the fact that we were going to try to do some kind of a questionnaire to work with each person's expertise so that we could work on that and then perhaps we could be a little bit more of service and we could pare down what needs to be done. Um, I don't know whether that's still appropriate or not, but I would just like to see us be able to move forward. Yeah, you read my mind. Um, that was something I was going to ask about next. <laughs> so, continue with this. Yes. Yes. Anybody object? I don't need a motion or anything. We're okay with that. We're continuing. Okay. So, what had what Stephanie is talking about, and what I had jotted down on my notes is: Would you be willing to perhaps send a, an email individually to Helen? to talk a little bit about what your expertise is, what contributions you think you can make. Um, Stephanie, help me with this, but the kind of stuff that we're, we're thinking about so that the district has an opportunity to know exactly who you are and what you can do to help in, in providing advice, what kind of support expertise you can provide. There were also some interest areas too, okay. Judy. Um, some had mentioned they would like to do learning walks with, um, right, right. And as an opportunity, serve on textbook committees, those right. types of things okay. as well. So, okay, I'm not sure everybody on this committee knows all of the things that they can do. Yeah, um, we do. Yeah, because they missed so much of that that conversation. It kind of goes so. back and speaks to the the issue of we really need some sort of a formal orientation for all incoming advisory committee members so that you have a much broader picture of what it is than just being appointed to a curriculum advisory committee. Yeah, or it could just be an online training. Exactly. Okay. 
Okay. We also need a list maybe to give to put out of ideas uh, so people because they don't know what opportunities are out there where they could help. As individuals you're talking about? Yeah. Them. You know, like the, the classroom walkthroughs, things like that. Okay. So some kind of a formal orientation to what this committee has done in the past or can do in the future? Are we asking district personnel to do that at the next meeting? I hate to ask district personnel to do anything on exactly. what they have okay. already. So, so what do you have in mind? Well, one of the things sometimes I think we look at, because we're looking at it all, is our average is around the state averages, but the state average is around 50 to 60. That's a lot of kids that, for whatever reason, aren't where we'd like them to be. Uh, is we, the whole concept of differentiated instruction. And there was mention that for an algebra class, we do it in this extra additional class. That'd be an example. You can have an intensive reading class for some types of students. You can have different materials for some types of students and not others. We have that now, but we still have about 40% of the students that's not working. And if you look at the gains, we have about 58% of the students that's not working for. So there's something in there that isn't moving like we would like it to. So that's where I think we, we spent some time. How are we as a system? Because I think sometimes teachers are, uh, and I, I won't use, don't want to use the word stymied, but they're, they work within the boundaries that the system allows them to work. Well, for about 40% of the students, the system isn't working. So what is it within the system that we can free our teachers up to do that's going to make things better for them in the classroom and allow our students to have that type of differentiated instruction that our teachers do? How can we set our teachers free to do the things that our students need if, if we have constraints that are built in within the system? Okay, so I hear what you're suggesting is the problem. What are you suggesting that we do? Well, I would like the staff to tell us what differentiated programs they have now. Who's where for what reason? Who's where for what reason? And who isn't there for what reason? And then within that group, if you look at our intensive reading classes now, if we have them, okay, who is it working for and who isn't it working for? So because I, I've been involved with those type of things, people here know that I have, uh, and there was some, as, and I'm not, this is not a pro or a con. It was mentioned by uh, one of the speakers from the staff that things changed and then the district's really practice and things. So as we move back to those things, it'd just be kind of interesting to see how we're, what are we moving back to and for what reason, how are we changing the system? Okay. The staff, I think, knows what I'm talking about, I think. So, so are you suggesting that they do some presentation on those lines at our next meeting that is integrated with the data that they just gave us. You know, we can, we can show we can go through the data, but then show the differentiation and what what we're doing for each specific group of kids for what you were referring to. It's just um, it's a lot for elementary, middle, and high for a twenty-minute presentation. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be. Uh, and do you have a place you want thing. us? Yeah, do you want a place you want us to start? Um, or like just do reading, or just do math, or science? Uh, one time. Okay, because we had all that parliamentary, and that's true. I was thinking of just reading to start with, because that was the one that had forty-two percent of the Yeah, yeah. 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 and reading is only twenty-five percent of the So they were attempting to that next time. Great, reading differentiated instruction. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we're good on that. Everybody's okay with that? Yeah. Okay. I like that. And then the other thing that I was sort of asking you to do for homework is email. give email. Hmm? email Helen. Yeah, email. Email homework, yes. To Helen about what it is that your expertise is, what kinds of contributions you think you can make to the district. And then also have the district start thinking about some of the things that you would like this committee to do. And then if we can do that within the next you know, week or two, then maybe we can put our heads together and see where we are on this so that we can tailor these meetings in such a way that we maximize the use of this group. Because I heard some very different 
uh, types of expertise among the committee members here. So we want to make sure that we take advantage of that from technology to business and law and previous experience teaching. So we have a lot of, and current experience teaching, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, if we can kind of summarize that, I think that would really, really help if we know that we had a couple of people with strong technology foci in here. But I don't remember what everybody said. I don't know if anybody else remembers what everybody said, but. There's a recording on YouTube. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to ignore myself. <laughs> I think what Stephanie, Stephanie said oh, yeah. really registered with me. Okay. If you can kind of give us a guideline of what we're going to be looking at and how our expertise could uh, complement that. Yes. I, I like having that done first because, I mean, we could spew out all the things that we've done in the past or, or do now. Let's do it but, both ways, though, because what we know and can do may influence what they want us to okay. do. Okay. Okay. So it's got to be kind of like, for me, a two-way street. Make sense? Okay. So within the next week or so, if you would email to Helen so she can compile what our interest expertise are, um, things that we want, that we know we contribute and want to do. Anything else? Did I miss anything, Stephanie? Web from... I have to deal with Stephanie Snyder and Webb. That's really <laughs> Does that pretty much cover what you were talking about? Okay. And um, Larry, are you okay with, yes. with yes. what we did? Anybody else have anything else that they think we need to do before the next meeting? Yes. I, I just have to roll, Christian. I, uh, I guess in relation to one of the presentations we had last year where there were a bunch of committees and different types of things that we could have belonged to or contributed to, and that we were well, I've never touched base on that. I know from that presentation I, I joined with Shelly Taylor, the drop-off prevention mm -hmm. committee, but it was that something that maybe we were referring to, some of those committees and how those yes. levels of expertise, Stephanie? Yeah. So maybe bringing back that presentation that was presented okay. way, you know, at the beginning of last okay. year, okay. where there were all these different committees, okay. areas of, the areas areas of want interest. You to talk about that, the, that list? Yeah, yeah, that list, and it was in red, yeah. and some people okay. wanted to show interest in certain committees. So, so if we could ask our district folks to pull that back together, to even to make sure shift it over the summer and you know, things change, but some of the opportunities for service and for learning that this committee has, and we can put those on the agenda too. Another thing that we can do, if just if you're interested, because as Kinda said, we have 34 different leading and learning trainings going on pretty much all the time around here, like they're going on next door. We can send you all of the dates, and it's almost every day of the month that something is happening here, reading math or science. And then just let us know if you want to join, because a lot of the stuff they're going over will show, no matter what content area you go to, it's going to show the formatives, the instructional guides, the curriculum maps, um, some of the differentiation. So it might just help you get a little bit of an idea of where we're going. Okay, so I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. And I look forward to working with you again. Thank you for um, your confidence in me. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And I guess I need a motion to adjourn. We make a motion, motion. to adjourn. Thank you. And then I got to say that. If I don't have the name tags back up on the All in favor. The discussion? No. All in favor. All in favor. I know. Well, we can talk about other things.